So, depression. Common problem, right? Very common. Very, very common. Um, depression is an overwhelming problem. The statistics are amazing. Um, it's linked to pain, sorrow, sadness. Um, it's been said that depression affects um, up to 25% of our population. That's staggering. It affects your sleep, your work, your home life, leisure, your goals, your emotions, your relationships. And I want you to look at the Bible because the Bible speaks to everything we've been talking about, right? And it's everything we need for life and godliness. And so I want you to open your Bibles to Psalm 13. <coughs> and I'm going to give you a little tip for studying your Bible and for looking, looking for things in the Bible, looking for answers in the Bible, because believe me, this book is amazing. It's full of answers. So in Psalm 13, verses 1 and 2, it says, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and every day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Does that sound like a depressed person? Yeah, like how long? And I want you to notice what word in verse 2 do you think describes depression? There's a particular word in there. Sorrow. Yes. Now, this is your tip, your Bible study tip for the day. Whenever you go to find answers for something in the Bible, you want to call it what the Bible calls it, because then you're going to find the answers. If we looked up depression in the back in the concordance of my Bible, would we find anything? No. If we looked up bipolar, would we find it back here? No. I, you know, we would not find that. It's a modern term. It's a modern term. But we want to call things what the Bible calls them, okay? And so in this case, instead of depression, you would look for verses on sorrow and sadness. And I just want to give you a heads up that this book was written by one of our own, Dr. Charlie Hodges, who's an MD, and it's down in our resource center. And he, he's a medical doctor, and he says that that's, it's unfortunate that we call everything depression. You know, even a woman who, who her husband has died, a widow, and she's struggling with the loss, we would call her depressed. Whereas the Bible would just say, there's sadness. Some, sadness in life is normal. There is a normal amount of sorrow and sadness. We live in a sin-cursed world, right? So we shouldn't be surprised. And so it, it, he just does an excellent job in talking about that, and we'll refer to this in a little bit too. But if you remember, um, we talked about that there, there's, there's a place for sorrow in our lives, and it's not all bad, right? And we'll talk about why in just a moment. All right, now also I want you to look at Psalm 31, verses 9 through 13. In Psalm 31, verse 9, it says, Be merciful to me, O Lord, for I am in distress. My eyes grow weak with sorrow, my soul and my body with grief. My, soul is co my life is consumed by anguish, my years by groaning, my strength fails because of my affliction, and my bones grow weak. And this is, again, a description of something that we would call, in modern-day terms, depression. So for the sake of um, just making this make sense to you, I will use the term depression, but I do want you to understand that the Bible would call that sorrow or sadness, okay? Um, and the Bible is full of all kinds of things that can help us with that, and we'll look at them in a moment. All right. Um, Living with depression. Depression affects people spiritually, mentally, emotionally, physically, relationally. It's very all-encompassing. People who suffer from depression spiritually, they feel very distant from God. They're troubled by God's character. They're confused about if God's in heaven and he's good, why is this happening? They doubt his love and his care, his ability to make things better. 
Mentally, people who suffer from depression often don't have very good control of their thoughts, right? And they tend to spiral into these patterns of depressive thoughts <clears throat> and um, repetitive questions about their inability to focus or function. Emotionally, you can see not, rather seem numb without the ability to feel again. There may be moments of fear, anger, panic, frustration, resentment, jealousy. Physically, your body may feel heavy and tired, like there's no energy to accomplish anything. The idea of getting up and completing a task may seem insurmountable. Relationships become more dysfunctional. You move into isolation. You feel like no one understands. Relationships are just too hard. Depression is just such a def uh, generally accepted and used term. But uh, if you, ha you have there in your notes a list of some of the things that are included in depression. And, and I have to be honest with you, ladies. Um, my husband worked for years for a pharmaceutical company that created a very um, popular antidepressant that was like stormed the market. And we watched as he worked for this pharmaceutical company, we watched how they broadened the definition of depression because they wanted to sell more pharmaceuticals. And that is what happens a lot of times. We watched that happen with uh, the other psychotropic drugs that were sold by this particular pharmaceutical company. They would redefine schizophrenia or you know, depression or whatever. They would create this list of symptoms that would encompass probably most of us in the room. And uh, unfortunately, that was driven by um, wanting to make sales and is driven by money. So as I read through these, think about that and think about the sense of this, okay? The, think about this logically. Okay, um, the, here are these symptoms. A depressed mood most of the day, nearly every day. Diminished interest in all or most activities. Significant weight loss, weight gain. <laughs> Appetite problems nearly every day. They're not eating or overeating, right? Inability to sleep or sleeping too much, right? Feeling restless or no energy, the inability to have energy. Fatigue, feelings of worthlessness or excessive guilt, diminished ability to think, concentrate, and make decisions. Recurrent thoughts of death, including possible suicidal thinking. And, and unfortunately, coming off of some of these psychotropic drugs makes those symptoms even more. You know, they may prescribe them, and then when you try to um, when you come off of them, you just have to be very careful and always have a physician help you. Okay, so the criteria are flexible enough according to the DSM-4, which is out for the American Psychological, oh, I might, I was, DSM-5, that's what I was thinking, it's the DSM-5. Yes, um, it causes confusion. There are no objective medical tests that can be performed to diagnose depression. There's no blood test, there's no scan, there's no biopsy. And I have to be honest with you, the, the thing that I'm going to read to you an article, or excerpts, I won't read the whole article, but I can forward this to you if you're interested. It's, it's rather lengthy, but I'll just read some parts of it. Um, this article was written by Bruce E. Levine, who happens to be a, um, just a moment. He is a practicing clinical psychologist. He, it was published in Truthout, a secular website, news website. And he is um, writing about um, so an investigative reporter named Robert Whitt Whitaker and what he discovered when he researched um, drug treatments that were making, for depression, that were making many patients worse over the long term. And he decided to investigate this. And he actually uh, won the 2010 Investigative Reporters Book Award. But uh, in the long term, the, here was the conclusion. In the long term, not all but many individuals who have been diagnosed with a psychosis actually do better without antipsychotic medication. Here's another quote. 
There is um, the pseudoscience of chemical imbalance. People heard that for years, the serotonin thing, and that there's a chemical imbalance. Um, he says here, the psyche, and in fact, this was a quote from Ronald Pies, editor in chief emeritus of Psychiatric Times. And he said, and I quote, in truth, the chemical imbalance notion was always a kind of urban legend, never a theory seriously propounded by well informed psychiatrists. Psychiatry, here's another quote, knew all along that the evidence wasn't really there to support the chemical imbalance notion, that it was a hypothesis that hadn't panned out, and yet psychiatry failed to inform the public of that crucial fact. The low serotonin theory of depression has been so completely discredited by leading researchers that maintaining the story with the public has just become untenable. Okay, and I could go on and on, it's like a nine page article. But that is to, I want to give you the truth. I want to tell you what is out there, and I'd be happy to send you this article if you'd like. Um, but there's, uh, unfortunately, that was a tactic to sell drugs. And it worked remarkably well, didn't it? Okay, so we still have depression, though. And depression, might, we're going to define as an overwhelming mood or feeling of hopelessness, sadness, and despair, which results in an inability to handle life. But there's a lot of hope, ladies, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. Tons of hope. Okay. Depression is genuine suffering. While depression may be difficult to define, it is very real. But suffering of any sort should bring God into view. And it can cause you to either find God or to blame and reject him. And that pain of the suffering of depression can bring very valuable questions to your mind regarding your existence and your relationship with God. Let's read Deuteronomy 8, verses 2 and 3. Deuteronomy 8, 2 and 3. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the desert or in the wilderness these 40 years to humble you and to test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. And that's just an Old Testament illustration of the desert experience that you might be having or the wilderness experience of depression that God may have allowed that to come into your life to test you and to help you ask the big questions about life and to help you evaluate your life. So in that case, it's a good thing, right? Suffering reveals our hearts. As we said, a lot of these, these emotions are windows to our hearts. You remember I described it as the, the idiot light on your dashboard <laughs> that you don't just put tape over it or cover it up and you don't just take a hammer and pound it to make the idiot light go off. No, your emotions are those lights on the dashboard and they tell you what's going on in your heart. So it's a window to your heart. And so when you're depressed, when you have someone who's experiencing depression, we need to look at the heart and, and, and determine which, what God would have us to do with that. Proverbs 4.26 says, watch the path of your feet and all your ways will be established. God wants us to be very careful as we walk through life and suffering and depression provides an opportunity to determine if you are walking on a path of faith or if you are walking in isolated independence. All right. Up. I'm a little behind there. Walking in the wilderness, that was from the Deuteronomy passage. And it does feel like a wilderness when you're depressed. All right, possible biblical causes. And here's where we get a diagram. Yay! <laughs> if you were to look carefully at your life, you would probably be able to discover, and, you, and if you've experienced depression and struggle with depression, if you look carefully at your life, you'll probably be able to discover some habits that have helped depression build. And they usually follow a progression. 
And I'm going to show that for you here. Okay. It goes like this. You're going along through life and something happens that causes you to have a sad thought. It could be the death of a loved one. It could be the death of a relationship. Um, you know, girls who've had engagements broken and so forth. Or it could be the loss of a dream. You always dreamed that your life would be a certain way and it's not. It could be a lot of things, right? So you have a sad thought. And then what, you, what happens with that sad thought is you have a lack of a desire to fill, fulfill your responsibilities. Lack of desire to do what you need to do, to do your responsibilities. And then you have another sad thought because you haven't fulfilled your responsibilities and then you don't want to do them anymore. And then you sad more and you don't want to do them anymore. And you go down like this until you're in this depressive, you're imprisoned by your habits. So what you have here, and an, an illustration of this would be, an illustration of this would be Something negative happens, something hard happens. Um, college student, you flunk a class. Uh, a wife, your husband says he wants a divorce. I mean, it's, I'm, they're serious things. And then you don't want to do the dishes, let's say. You don't want to do the dishes. You don't feel like doing the laundry. So you don't, because you don't feel like it. So then you get up the next morning, and you're, you have a sad thought because you look at the pile of dishes, and you have nothing to wear. And you just kind of, ugh, you feel sad. And, and then you think, you look at the pile of dishes and it gets bigger. And then you don't want to do them. You really don't want to do them because it looks so big. I don't have time. I'm not going to do them. And you head down in this spiral of not doing your dishes or not doing your laundry or just, I'm not going to work now. I'm not going to do this. And you're just, it's, it feeds on itself if you don't stop it, okay? Because you don't, now, what kind of, Think about the train diagram. What's in the engine here? Your emotions. Your feelings are running the train. Your feelings are running your life. Right, right. And, and then you end up in this very depressed state that is kind of like being in prison. That is um, very, you've formed these habits of thinking that can be just very much like a mental prison. So, here are some of the things that possible causes. You could lose someone or something that was the center of your life. When you make someone or something the center of your life other than God, something other than God is the center of your life, then when you lose it, you feel like you've lost your purpose in life. You feel alone. If that someone was your reason for, li li for living, and then they're out of your life, you feel lost. And you feel like you have no reason to go on. The Bible calls this, the Bible calls this idolatry. That's idolatry. And in Romans 1.25, it says, they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature and what was created rather than the creator. And that's what we're doing when we make people the center of our universe, when we make money the center of our universe, when we make approval, approval of others the center of our universe, we are worshiping that as an idol. That's not going to end well. So that can happen. Another possibility is failing when being successful is mandatory. That should be in quotes. Like when you have built unbiblical expectations of success, and you're hopelessly defeated when you fail. If our goal is to please anyone other than Jesus Christ, you're going to be devastated when people are unhappy with your performance, when they don't give you the praise you feel you deserve, when your children don't respect you the way that you think they ought to respect you, or your husband 
treat you the way you think he ought to treat you. Or you're, you pin all your success on your performance in a job. You pin all your sex on per success on your performance as a housekeeper, as a friend, but you're, <coughs> excuse me, not focusing on the most important person, right? Jesus. And if you know him as your savior, you don't have to worry about pleasing him, right? He's already pleased with you. That's the beauty of walking in the Christian life. God is on your side. Okay, feeling like you've done something wrong. Maybe you have done something wrong, right? We all sin, and sin separates us from God. And if you have unconfessed sin in your life, you're going to have struggles. God's provision through Jesus Christ was that we could have daily forgiveness, right? Hallelujah. 1 John 1, 9, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we try to manage our own mistakes and take care of our own sin, we're going to feel weighted down. But hallelujah, we don't have to do that. If you know Jesus, hallelujah. He's forgiven you. How about being angry and not dealing with it correctly? We talked about anger and how anger can result in all kinds of things, and it can result in depression. You keep that, that clam. The clam anger, it's often tied to unforgiveness and a lack of trust in God. Um, so knowing how to solve that and respond to that hurt and sin biblically can be helpful. Ephesians 4.26 says, Be angry and yet do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Don't give the devil a foothold. And then we said, Believing wrongly about God. A common side effect of depression is that you're you've concluded that God is not good. God is not good, and he's not involved in my life or the lives of his children for good. And we look at our lives through the lens of that um, thought, and we look at our lives through just our circumstances, and we cast judgment on God, actually. Um, why don't you open your Bibles to Psalm 119, verses 2 and 3. This is beautiful. Just beautiful. Psalm 119, verses 2 and 3. Blessed are they who keep his statutes. And you know blessed. The word blessed in the Bible means happy. Happy are they who keep his statutes and seek him with all their heart. They do nothing wrong. They walk in his ways. You have laid down precepts that are to be fully obeyed. You're, there's happiness, there's joy in living life according to this book, the way God designed it to be lived. Okay, any questions? I can stop for a minute. Questions, thoughts, comments? We've kind of gone through that kind of lickety split. Anybody? All righty. The happy part, you know, the uh, psychotropic drugs might not give you the help, but God does, right? Okay, suffer biblically. It's important to realize that God ordains that this journey on earth accomplish a few things in our lives. First, he wants our hearts drawn toward him so that we'll learn to love him and enjoy him and that it will draw attention to his majesty and glory. So he wants us to know him and love him. And if we don't hurt, maybe God has allowed depression in your life so that you'll turn to him. Because maybe if he didn't bring that into your existence, you would just go on your merry way and not even think about him. Secondly, God wants to conform us to the image of Christ so that we would reflect Christ to others and show others what Jesus looks like. And God does that oftentimes through trials, right? Do the hard stuff. Because as I just said, sometimes if we don't have the hard stuff in our lives, we go on our merry way and we don't even think about pleasing God and being more like Jesus and what he has to say. God does not delight in bringing pain. 
into your life, but he will so that something better can be accomplished, something that lasts forever. So Romans 8, 28, and 29. Does anybody want to try to quote that? Romans 8, 28, and 29. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, right? Who are called according to his purpose. For those he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. So God wants you to candidly cry out to him. When you talk to him, talk to him, be honest. He knows your heart anyway, right? He wants to move in your life. And he, he wants to draw you to himself and to equip you with power for living. And I love Psalm 107.6. There in your notes it says, Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distress. And if you read that psalm, it, that goes on again and again. Instance after instance, people are getting into messes, and then they cry out to the Lord, and he delivers them. He will. Learn to evaluate biblically. We can allow, especially if you're depressed, you don't, you're, you're not thinking clearly. You're not going to be evaluating your life clearly, right? And we can be shaped by the lies of that, unfortunately. And that's why you need to be reading your Bible, believing that God is there. We may think, I can't ever handle this. I'll never, the suffering will never end. The pain will never stop. Um, you may feel hopeless. But the pe people who are depressed so often act on their feelings. And the feelings are running the train. And you have to, as a believer, to, to step out of that and to act on truth. And I have to, I want you to open your Bibles to Isaiah 45. And you may be thinking, okay, God, you've let this bad thing happen to me. I don't like it. I don't know why you did it. Um, I don't see the sense of it. It's hard. It's painful. Yeah, I mean, go ahead and tell those things to God. But let me just read to you Isaiah 45, 9, and verse 11. Woe to him who quarrels with his maker, to him is, who is but a potsherd among the potsherds on the ground. Does the clay say to the potter, what are you making? And then in verse 11, God says, Do you question me about my children or give me orders about the works of my hands? He's God, right? He's God. He, his ways are so much higher than our ways. His mind is infinitely wiser and more intelligent than anything we could ever begin to come up with. And his ways are best. And you just have to believe that and walk by faith that that's true. And act on what God's word says. So you want to make sure that your thoughts line up with this book, right? Then you have truth in the engine of the train, right? And you're telling yourself the truth. And ladies, I'm just going to give you the example of flying a plane. I have pilots in my family, and it's very important when they're flying in bad weather, you probably know that they fly by their instruments, right? They cannot fly by their feelings. Do you know how many plane wrecks there have been, how many deaths, when a pilot flew by his feelings? when he felt like he was going up. And he thought, oh, I need to go you know, level off. And in fact, he was going down. And you get vertigo. You've heard that term. Vertigo means you don't know which way is up. You don't know which way is down. That really happens in planes when you're flying in a fog. So the pilots have to trust their instruments. They have to fly according to their instruments. Otherwise, they will crash the plane because it just, they're, it doesn't feel right. Ladies, that is a great illustration of when you're depressed or when things are hard. Fly by the instruments, <laughs> right? Fly by truth. Let truth guide you. Make your decisions based on truth. Don't make your decisions based on how you feel because you're gonna get into trouble. And God has given us his true and precious promises that are absolutely going to be fulfilled and are absolutely right. 
So, and, and you know what? The, the other thing that I just want to say about that is it's, it may not feel right, but if God says do it, do it, right? You may not feel like getting out of bed, but you get out of bed. So you start to move in a life that's oriented on truth. And, and I must say, too, that you may not understand all that God is doing, right? He's God, and we're not. And there can be times where it's really, really hard, and you think, why is this happening? I wish it weren't, and it doesn't seem right to me. But fly by the instruments, right? <laughs> fly by truth, and trust that God is good, and that he is doing something good. All right, biblical obedience one step at a time. And this is how we turn this around. So we go from this spiral and where you get yourself in trouble, where you spiral down, to where you start to make, you're down here in the pits and you decide based on faith that you're going to feel better, that you're going to, I mean, you're going to do better, and then you're going to feel better. <laughs> if you look at Genesis 4, verses 6 and 7, Genesis 4, 6 and 7, that's when Cain, God is talking to Cain. And if you know the story of Cain and Abel, what has Cain just done? He just killed his brother. He just committed murder, right? It's, uh, and then Cain, the Lord says to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? Because, okay, I'm sorry, this is before he kills his brother, okay? <laughs> Let's push the uh, rewind button here. Okay, so Cain and Abel bring an offering to God. God looked with favor on Abel's. He did not look with favor on Cain's. Cain gets angry about it. God didn't like my offering. And God says, wait, 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 stop. Why are you angry? In verse 6, why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door and it desires to have you, but you must master it. Why is your if you do what is right, you'll be accepted. So God is telling him, you don't let your feelings guide you, Cain, but he did, unfortunately. All right, so now, if you're down in this downward spiral, you choose to do a task. If you have a sink full of dishes and you've been so <coughs> depressed that it's piled up, then just say, and your laundry, let's say for instance your laundry's in a pile on the couch and you never folded it, or whatever. Choose one. Do one thing. Do the laundry. Fold the laundry and put it away. And you know what? You will, so you do, you do one task. You do what you're supposed to do, no matter if you feel like it, you know, I hate folding laundry, I hate putting laundry away, but you're not going to let that govern your life. You're going to say, I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to do right. And then you know what you do? You feel joy because you did right. You know that you did something right. And so then you get up the next morning and you say, OK, I'm not, I, I don't have time to do all those dishes before work, so I'll just do, I'll do, wash all the cups, or I'll wash all the plates. And so you, you're doing right again. And you're going to feel better because when you get home, it's not going to be such a mess. And you're going to know, you're going to have the joy in your heart that you have done these things. And Jesus said, now that you know these things, blessed will you be if you do them. So you're going to do, and it, this continues in upward spiral and creates habits that just build, you know, the joy in your life and, and helps you to overcome the depression. Questions, thoughts, comments? And, and if you just make it your goal to do one little thing, I mean, if your goal was to get your house spotless, and, and do you think that's going to go well? No, because then you're not going to achieve your goal, and then you'll get depressed <laughs> again. <laughs> so just make little steps. Make little goals, and just say, I'm going to do just a little bit today. You know, today, maybe I won't get all that laundry folded, but I'll just get, you know, I'll get part of it folded. I'll turn on the timer and say, I'm going to fold laundry for 15 minutes. And then I'll be done. But that's good. You're doing, you're making right steps. And that creates a lot of hope. And part of what else will create hope 
is realizing that this life isn't all there is. And we've talked about this almost every week because when your feelings are running the train, it's often because you think this life is all, everything there is and things are not going the way you want them to go in your life right now. And that's going to be a tough way to live because this life isn't all there is. And we live in a sin-cursed world. So you want to live with eternity in mind. Um, 2 Corinthians 4.16 says, Therefore we do not lose heart, though our outer man is decaying, and believe me, I'm old enough to be feeling that, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day, for our light and momentary affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. While we look not only at the things that are seen, but the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are temporary, but the things that are unseen are eternal. They last forever. Okay? And the Bible teaches that the afflictions that you have in this life and how you handle them are working for you an eternal weight of glory for you. God is glorified in you and there is an eternal reward. An eternal reward for suffering well in this life. Does that give you hope? I hope so. God's watching. And you know what? You have a bunch of unseen um, unseen angels, unseen demons, unseen spirit world that is watching us. True that? Yeah. Yeah. And I remember reading about, I mean, Johnny Erickson Tata, you know who she is? She was, she's the quadriplegic and speaks nationally, etc. And I remember her saying, you know, that gave her such hope because so much of her suffering, she suffered alone. Um, you know, imagine, you know, not even be able to bat a fly off your nose. You know, she can't. Not being able to wipe your nose when it runs. Not being able to get a drink when you're coughing and thirsty. Um, but she said she, she had, had a lot of hope knowing that if she suffered well, even while she was by herself, that God was honored by that and that she was being watched and that there are eternal rewards. That's very hopeful. And there is an eternity that, um, and, and how you live this life will affect that eternity in some way. And again, I, I can't begin to explain that, but God teaches that over and over that, and it's not like you earn heaven, never. We could never, right? Jesus earned heaven for us. We all, we've all earned hell, right? We've all, we all deserve to go to hell, but because of Christ, we aren't. But um, he does teach that if you know Christ and you suffer for him, you will be rewarded. And that's very encouraging. Deb? One of the things that helped me when I come back into the new function, I have to remember that we are actually walking around in God. Mm-hmm. And that is the most important thing. He is omnipresent. He is absolutely omnipresent. He's everywhere. Yes. Okay. God will not give you more than you can handle, right? 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you are able, but when you're tempted, he'll provide a way out. Lots of hope in those verses. How about thankfulness? Usually a depressed person finds it hard to be thankful. Um, they're overwhelmed. They focus on the problem. They're overwhelmed by their feelings, fears, doubts, failures. And so the habit of being focused on themselves has overtaken the life of learning to be thankful. So often depressed people are very self-focused. They're not really thinking about others. They're just thinking about themselves, which the Bible calls selfishness, right? And when you try, when you start to take steps to, to move out of that selfishness and you take steps to being thankful for what God has done, I try to start my day every day with just listing things I'm thankful for. 
and I teach my kids to do that. And we would have thankfulness lists that we kept all year in school, a running list of things we were thankful for. Um, I know at Vision of Hope, you guys still do 10 thankfuls every day. I think that's awesome. What a wonderful habit. 10 things you're thankful for, and you list them every single day. Wow, I'm thankful today. I'm thankful for a warm house, because it got cold, didn't it? <laughs> There's so many things. And, and the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5.16 there, that rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. This is what God wants you to be doing. Having a heart full of thankfulness. And usually the people who are very thankful people are not extremely selfish people. A reverence for God. You want to study who God is. You're not going to trust somebody you don't know. You're not going to love somebody you don't know. So you get to know God. Read your Bible and get to know <laughs> him. Right? Psalm 119. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I think I know who that is. <laughs> <laughs> Psalm 119, verses 67 and 68 say, You are good. Oh, it says actually verse 67. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I obey your word. Gosh, we sometimes just have to be afflicted, don't we, to, to follow God. You are good, and what you do is good. So he's actually saying, you afflicted me, Lord, and that was good, right? Teach me your decrees. And then if you look on down in verse uh, 71, it was good for me to be afflicted so that I might learn your decrees. The law from your mouth is more precious to me than thousands of pieces of silver or gold. Could you say that about God's word? Is it more precious to you than bags of gold and silver? It's worth it, right? God's word is the treasure. Okay, so get to know God. And, I, I, and you remember I talked about making those three by five cards, listing the attributes of God, A to Z. That's a great help. I mean, you don't have to do that. You can do other things. But to just focus on getting to know God. Here are some additional helpful tips. All right, there are medical complications, okay, like, Depression can, be a, um, can occur with Parkinson's disease, multiple sclerosis, lupus, or thyroid disorders. If you have a medical doctor who can rule out those, that would be fine. And you can also have depression as a side effect from some prescription medications for blood pressure, heart problems, antibacterial drugs, or psychiatric medicines. So, but usually that's not the majority of us, right? Um, symptom relief. Um, when depression is discuss discussed, usually they try to relieve the symptoms, right, using medication. And I just want to read a excerpt. This is, again, Good Mood, Bad Mood by Charlie Hodges, who's an MD and who is a deacon in our church. He did a tremendous amount of research. I mean, he read so many studies. I am so in admiration of him because he just cites study after study of the American Medical Association and other organizations and lists the results of those studies. But this is in particular regard to antidepressants. The research examined 47 studies of antidepressants conducted by the makers of the medicines. And they found that 82% of the benefit of taking them came from the placebo effect. Do you know what the placebo effect is? A placebo is a pill that has nothing in it, right? A sugar pill, a something, oh, yeah. <laughs> so what does this mean? A placebo is the time-honored method of determining whether or not a treatment actually does anything for the patient who uses it. In such studies, the patients are divided into two groups, one group receives the active drug being studied. The second group receives a pill that looks like the first, but it has no medicine. The simple message from these studies is that in 82 to 87 percent of those treated, the drugs themselves were not the source of the benefit. The greatest benefit came from those who believed in the drug and had hope that the drug would help them. 
This presents an enormous challenge to the argument that depression is a disease and the medicine makes you feel better. If a sugar pill can cure the disease as well as a real drug 82% of the time, we cannot use the cure argument to prove the chemical imbalance theory. So anyway, if 82 to 87% of the time the people felt better because they believed they were getting a drug that was helping them. Isn't that staggering? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The placebo effect is, I mean, just believing. Hope is a powerful thing. Hope is a very powerful thing. He talks about here another study, and I don't have it right in front of me, but he, so I can't tell you the exact statistics, but in another study he cites, people were given um, surgery for arthritis in their knees. And like half the group got arthritis, got the arthritis surgery, the actual surgery. The other half got an incision that looked like they had had the surgery, but they did not. I mean, talk about a brave doctor, right? Doing his research. He did his research and he, he so half of the people got the arthritis surgery on their knee, the other half did not. And you know what? The ones who didn't have the surgery felt better. Right? Am I, I quoting that, Debbie? I, I, I'm almost done reading this book. I didn't know she was going to talk about it. It is a good book, and that is in there. Yeah. Yeah. Think about it. You would think arthritis surgery, it would be very objective, yeah. the idea of pain. But his point is that hope, hope is powerful. When people think they're being helped, when they hope. And so let's place our hope in Christ and in his promises, right? It's kind of amazing, isn't it? Okay. How about sleep? You know, if you're depressed, sleep disturbances are part of that package, and your judgment may be clouded. And so I just would say don't make any major life decisions if you're in intense depression, because uh, you're de you may not be making the, right, the best decisions. Um, disciplined living. You know, the more you can order your life biblically, the more balanced and manageable your tasks will be. If, for example, you always do your laundry on Monday, if you always make it a goal to have everything folded and put away by Tuesday, if you clean your bathrooms on Thursday, if you decide you're going to do all your bill paying on a certain, I mean, and you go to bed at a certain time and you get up at a certain time, you know, God made us to work well like that. God made us to work well with schedules and discipline, exercise, getting regular exercise. Um, Avoiding extreme diet changes, caffeine, sugar, alcohol, crazy workouts, limited nutrition, like just eating those, drinking those nutrition drinks or something. I mean, expect to crash, right? <laughs> That's not the way God made you. And, and so discipline your life and think about getting those things in order. And of course, reading your Bible. <laughs> If you're experiencing ongoing depression, it would be a good idea to talk to another person about what you're going through, right? And we have a counseling center, and if all this just kind of scratched the surface for you and you said, you know, I, I agree with what's being said, I think it's right, but I just am struggling to get myself going, then that's why we have the body of Christ, right? And we're here to help one another, and we have a great counseling center you can call and get an appointment and have lots of counselors who are very experienced helping people and the accountability that you might need to make some of the changes that you need to make. And, and you know what? There's no shame in that. No shame in that. Please do not think that. Don't, don't place a stigma on getting counseling. Please. It's, it's one anothering. That's all it is. It's biblical one anothering. And it's helping one another. So it's a it's very, very good thing. And, and, don't, and don't feel like just because I've given this talk that I expect you to have it all mastered. And no, you can, you can come get more help. All right, now I'm going to stop for a moment. Any questions or comments about anything I said? Anything that you would like to discuss? Debbie? I'm not sure where I read it, but I know in a, in a lot of these types of psychiatric diseases, they say if you have trouble sleeping, that's an issue. But I've read somewhere that if, if people would change their habits, like not 
might be on the computer or their cell phone, right, before they go to bed or not watch TV or just, they, if you just need to take a half hour to sort of unwind or people do simple things like that, they would be amazed how much better they sleep. Mm -hmm. And some people think they're sleeping okay, but they're really not because they're waking up, they're, you know what I mean? They're, you know, yeah, I mean, cell phones have really, things like cell phones and Netflix and Hulu, I mean, that's really wreaking havoc on people's sleep because they, you look at that screen and I mean your brain wakes up and then it's hard to go to sleep again. It's just not a good habit. Don't check your felt cell phone when you should be sleeping, right? Or, or um, yeah, and don't try, another thing that goes along with this depression thing is that we have such easy access to escapes like Hulu, right? Or Netflix or, you know, YouTube, texting, you know, whatever. But instead of dealing with your, the heart, you know, the issues that we talked about, about whether you not have a bad view of God or you made someone else the center of your life or you aren't confessing sin in your life and all these issues that we talked about, being angry and not dealing with it, um, being angry at God. And instead of dealing with some of those deep heart issues, you find a show on Hulu that you want to watch and you just your brain goes into veg land and <laughs> you're not solving the problem right so we live in a world where it's really easy to do that and I would just encourage you to remember the diagrams and go for the joy <laughs> of and and if you need help with the accountability of having a schedule then yeah let's get it if you go, if you're part of a ladies' Bible study, you can ask them for accountability to have a schedule, and that just helps tremendously. Any other comments? Thank you, Sarah. Um, postpartum depression is that addressed in the book? I just I know when I had kids, you just it's just like they like prepare you to be depressed. You will be depressed. <laughs> um, <laughs> He, uh, he focuses mostly on bipolar and depression in this. He doesn't focus on postpartum. Is that correct, Debbie? Do you remember? Okay. Um, there's something very real about your hormones and about the fluctuations that they have and about the effect of your mood. Now, how you quantify that, and has anybody ever been able to quantify that? No. Yeah, how do you measure on a scale? how much you know, your hormones are affecting you. It's very hard to quantify. But, but it's real. It, I mean, physicians will tell you it's real. I had an experience after I had my first daughter. Did I tell you about this? Mm -hmm. I did. Very Where, interesting. Yes. Very good. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> Should I tell it again? <laughs> yes. And tr you're a nurse, right? I'm a social worker. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Hormones are very real. Yeah, yeah, I'll just tell you my experience again. <laughs> okay, I had had my first daughter. I was sitting at her kitchen table. I, I must have had a sad thought of some kind. You know, I've talked to Dr. Smith about it. He's an MD, and he said, "Well, you must have had a sad thought." And I said, "I can't tell you what it is. I didn't. I don't remember." So I, I might have had this fleeting sad thought, but all of a sudden tears start rolling down my face. Tears, and it was about you know six weeks postpartum, or about whenever they say that the baby blues start to happen. And I'm sitting there at my kitchen table, and tears are just streaming <coughs> down my face. And I'm thinking, why am I crying? I am not sad. I'm fine. And I literally could not stop those tears. I remember getting up and walking through my house, having these tears. I wasn't sobbing. I just had like my tear ducts. I couldn't control them. They were just dumping tears down my face. And I thought, this is the weirdest thing. It is truly the weirdest emotional experience I've ever had physiologically because I, I, it took me a few minutes just to get uh, really concentrate and to try to get those tears stopped. There was some physiological thing going on with my body. And, it made, and I was sitting there thinking, well, this must be what people think, do when they postpartum depression thing, you know? And it, it opened my eyes to the reality of that, um, but it also opened my eyes to the fact that you don't have to be controlled by that. So I would just encourage you, ladies, um, with your monthly cycle, too, 
It's very real, but you don't have to be controlled by that. You do not have to be controlled by it. Any other this points? Another story. I, several years ago, I went in the hospital with some heart issues, and two days in a row, it happened to be winter, and I had been shoveling snow, and I had been told, chest peas, don't diagnose yourself. So, yes, well, the, the second May in a row, I'm calling, and this other, the food was there. Well, the, the nurse, who was trying to be helpful, so she would ask me questions like, well, have you had any stress lately? And I said, well, no, I'm more than normal. She's stressed. Anyway, she kept asking me all these questions, and finally she looked at me, she said, she was dead serious. She said, you know, you can be depressed and not know it. <laughs> and I remember thinking it was all I could do to keep from doing what you yeah. just did. Because I'm thinking, if I left, they're going to put me in a rubber room. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you can be depressed and, and, and not know it. Well, if I got to be depressed, that's the way I want it. Yeah. Not know it. <laughs> yeah, if I'm going to have to be depressed, I'd rather not know it. You can be depressed and not. She was dead serious. That's how you're trained. You can be depressed and not know it. Okay, and that, you know, I mean, that could be true of a person who is the clam, you know, a person who just stuffs things and watches Hulu and wants to escape and just doesn't want to deal with it. But Debbie, yeah. Uh, I was trying so hard not to laugh. <laughs> Any other? <laughs> no, I'm just saying that. That's how, that's how she They're trained, be. yeah. In 2009, I took the physical counseling and my degree in psych, and I never had my world spun around so much after I took the physical counseling. Because, and I remember calling my friend, who is an administrator of the facility, and I'm like, oh my gosh, um, Floyd and Carl Young aren't my friends. He goes, nope, they're not your friends. And I'm like, oh. I mean, because it turns your whole world around um, when you've been trained in psych or uh, even nursing to a degree because they deal with that too. They, you learn that um, it's just a different world. That's why if you're in that profession, this is very important to balance out your life. Because if you do years of this, I mean, right now, when you're talking about depression, I have to really tell myself, no, this is true, this is true, this is true. Mm -hmm. All that other stuff is not, and I really have to work at it because you've just been doing mm -hmm. it for so long. And even as, when you say bipolar, I kind of wrinkle a little bit because in my world, it really is a disease and I have to, it's hard. I'm gonna get this book tonight because mm -hmm. I'm very interested now. Yeah, yeah, I would suggest it. Um, because my world is around psychiatrists and psychologists and those things, and, and part of it, I'm having a hard time <laughs> with this because it's like, hey, wait, wait, no, bipolar is really weird, really weird, or really weird. Yes, it can be very weird. And, and real. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and I worked in a mental hospital when I first got out of college, and I've seen those things, and I don't know how to process all that. I don't know how to process them. When you were talking about postpartum uh, depression, I've seen women uh, with postpartum psychosis, and it's a horrible thing. And so is it like without real? I mean, right. know, are we talking about something that, I don't know, just I get overwhelmed when I combine my two worlds together. <laughs> that, that is very, those are some very good questions, Teresa, and I would I suggest that you get this book, and I there's some right other, now really good ones yeah and um, yes the whole mental hospital and you know I don't want to wade in beyond my depth here but we have to understand biblically speaking that we live in a sin cursed world and sin manifests itself in many forms and if you read in Mark chapter 5 let me just read this to you and think about this in terms of like where what would this person be like today and where would we put them what would we do with them Okay, Jesus got out of the boat, and a man with an evil spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot, and he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. This is a true story. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him, and he shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? Swear to God that you won't torture me. For Jesus had said, Come out of this man, you evil spirit. Jesus asked him, What is your name? And he said, My name is Legion, for we are many, many demons. 
And then Jesus casts the demons out of this man and they go into the pigs and run down the hillside. What will we be doing with a man who acted like that today? And is it possible that he is demon possessed? Yeah. And, and can I conclusively say that? No. But I think we have to be realistic. It's not like demon possession doesn't happen anymore. It's not like there are no demons who do things like that. And, and we have to understand, too, sin and the power of sin. And when you think about in the Old Testament, about like King Saul, he was, what would we have labeled him? Right. You know, he was, I don't know, manic depressive or whatever. He paranoid, was, paranoid, <laughs> yes, yeah. paranoid schizophrenic. What would we have labeled King Saul? Mm -hmm. You know, loving on David one minute, the next minute trying to kill him. Yes, yes, yes. And so the Bible doesn't airbrush those things. That's very real. And, and bizarre behavior is in the Bible. And, and so, I, I'm not, again, I'm not pretending to be an authority on that, but I think that does, I think we would be amiss if we did not think about things at least with that as a possibility. Any other comments? You know, I had a I had a thing that said, well, let's talk one thing. I know the person in my life and two people make decisions and the biblical counselor who also happened to be a pastor, very well respected by this church, made a comment to me, you know, you and I did not want him on medication. We didn't want him to deal with the problem physically. But if he's not going to, having him on medication is probably safer. The people that are around you know what I'm saying? Exactly. That, that's where that's and wouldn't I rather, when you think about the history of mental is, illness and mental institutions, mm -hmm. wouldn't I rather see those people who don't, who, you know, who don't have Christ, be um, be on a medication as opposed to in some of those situations right. that were horrific in those mental institutions, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a tough issue. Yeah. Yeah. That, that is a big statement because there are some creepy things that have happened that, yeah, if that person isn't medicated and they're out in society and they're not going to seek, hey, you know, seek that person's help and see what they're saying. Heavy stuff, huh? Mm -hmm. Big heavies. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. Like having, I don't know, the things that come into our life, so that lightning bolt, like, does God use those as, like, discipline in a way? Because, I mean, we are his children, and we discipline, like, our children because we want the right things to come from them. So it's not just, like, him putting ways in us. Is it, <coughs> could it be for both? I mean, like, the way you described it wasn't necessarily as discipline, but I didn't know if that was. Absolutely. Hebrews chapter 12 is all about that, that God disciplines us for our good. It says in here, the Lord disciplines those he loves. As a father, the, you know, the son he delights in. Endure hardship as discipline. God's treating you as his son. For what son is not disciplined by his father? And he said, God disciplines for us for our good that we may share in his holiness. Does that answer your question? Yeah. That's Hebrews 12. And and uh, yeah, once you know Christ, you know that he's disciplining you for your good. And, and that the hard, it, it could be that it is discipline, but it could be that it's just to display his glory. You know, he said when Jesus had the, I was the blind man and they said, why was this man blind? You know, who sinned, his parents or him? And Jesus said, that's not why it happened. It happened so that my glory would be displayed. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. So does that help, yes. Heather? Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, Adrian. Well, that is exactly why the disciples asked that question. Okay. Yeah, that, because it's, that's in the Old Testament, that the sins of the parents will be visited on the children. 
I'm not really prepared to wade into that one, but um, but I the deal. Uh, then there also in in Ezekiel it says that each person is going to pay for their own sins, and so in that respect we God holds us accountable for our own sin. Now, will the sins of the parents be visited on you? In some form, that can, al- that can happen if God allows it. For example, if your parents were, your mom was an alcoholic, you will have fetal alcohol syndrome. Her sins are visited on you. Yeah. You know, and that can manifest itself in different ways. Does that kind of make sense? Now, when I, whether I could definitively say it on some, that one's a pretty easy one to see, but some of them may not be. Any others? Q&A? This has been great, ladies. Let me pray, and we'll be dismissed. Lord Jesus, we praise you that your word has everything we need for life and godliness, and that, Jesus, you are our treasure, and all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden in you. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us to be good students of your word, to live by it, and I pray for anyone here tonight, Jesus, who might be struggling with depression, I pray, Father, that you'd give them hope and that you would help them to see that there is a way out and according to your word. Amen.